In the first video of this series on Julius Caesar, I mentioned how the assassination of Caesar had been a well-known story throughout history and had fascinated the Western world for well over a thousand years. And to wrap up this series, I want to expand upon that statement now. In the play, after they've killed Caesar, Brutus proposes the sort of bloody theatrics that bring Calpurnia's dream about Romans bathing in Caesar's blood to life. Listen to the exchange that takes place between him and Cassius. Brutus says, Stoop, Romans, stoop, and let us bathe our hands in Caesar's blood up to the elbows and besmear our swords. Then walk we forth, even to the marketplace, and waving our red weapons o'er our heads, let's all cry peace, freedom, and liberty. Cassius agrees, Stoop then and wash. How many ages hence shall this our lofty scene be acted over in states unborn and accents yet unknown? Brutus also wonders, How many times shall Caesar bleed in sport that now on Pompey's basis lies along no worthier than the dust? Cassius answers, So oft as that shall be, so often shall the not of us be called the men that gave their country liberty. So both Brutus and Cassius make predictions here. Brutus's turns out to be right, and Cassius's turns out to be wrong. Brutus is right that in states unborn and accents yet unknown, their scene will be acted out. Of course, the terrific joke here is that if you're reading the play or watching the play being performed, then the prophecy is being fulfilled right at that moment. But Cassius's prediction that the conspirators will be praised for their act doesn't exactly come true. Regardless of whether or not they had honorable intentions, the conspirators have come to be seen as nothing more than despicable traitors. Caesar's final lines in Latin, a tu brute, have entered into our cultural consciousness as something that would be said to someone who backstabs you or betrays you. The evil deed is remembered, not the good intentions. And this is actually an idea that Antony brings up during Caesar's funeral. At one point he says that the evil that men do lives after them, the good is often teared with their bones. And of course, adding to the animosity that one may have felt toward the conspirators for assassinating a great man, there was the fact that their action actually did the opposite of what they intended. It created enough chaos, enough of a need for, imme for an immediate solution in the form of an authority figure, that pretty soon Octavius became the new emperor of Rome, and the country was ruled by emperors throughout the rest of its history. But, let, but let's look now at what future writers and notable persons thought of Caesar's assassination. The event became a pretty famous subject for both poets and artists pretty soon after the fact. When Octavius became emperor, then he was going by the name Caesar Augustus, everyone saw the wisdom in portraying his murdered uncle Caesar as a martyr figure. figure. The poet Ovid, in his epic poem The Metamorphosis, ends that said poem with the description of Caesar's murder and then with the description of his deification. He talks about how Caesar's heir will be a blessing to the world and about how Caesar himself has now taken his place up in the stars amongst the other gods. The Divine Comedy, uh, which was the great epic poem written by Dante in the Middle Ages in the early 14th century, uh, harkens back to the action on the Ides of March as well. In the first part of the Divine Comedy, the Inferno, Dante is taken on a tour through the nine circles of hell by Virgil, the Roman poet who I've mentioned before. So he goes through the different circles of hell, each one descending lower and lower, and on each one there are souls suffering for a particular sin. The farther down one goes, the worse the sin would have to be for you to have ended up there. When they reach the very bottom of hell, after they've passed up the lechers and the practitioners of dark arts and the murderers and the gluttons, at the very bottom are those who have been punished for the sin of treachery. In the middle of it all, they see the devil himself, the arch betrayer, and he's depicted as this uh, horrible beast who's frozen in ice. Dante describes the devil as a beast having three heads. Now listen to this. He says that he wept out of six eyes and down three chins, tears gushed together with a bloody froth. Within each mouth, he used it like a grinder. With gnashing teeth, he tore to bits a sinner. The forward sinner found that biting nothing when matched against the clawing, for at times his back was stripped completely of its hide. That soul up there who has to suffer most, my master said, Judas Iscariot, his head inside, he jerks his legs without. 
Of those two others, with their heads beneath, the one who hangs from that black snout is Brutus. See how he writhes and does not say a word. That other, who seems so robust, is Cassius. So to the medieval mind, the three worst sinners in all of history, uh, those who have the special honor of being eaten by the devil himself for all of eternity, uh, were Judas Iscariot, who was the disciple who betrayed Jesus Christ, and Brutus and Cassius. Now moving forward a couple hundred years or so to the 1800s, we see how John Wilkes Booth, the man who assassinated U.S. President Abraham Lincoln, was influenced by the play. Now Booth had been an actor and he had starred in a production of Julius Caesar in 1864. He played the role of Mark Antony. Now what's funny about this is that he had wanted the role of Brutus, but he had lost out to his own brother, Edwin Booth. Uh, show business was the Booth family business. John Wilkes's father, Junius Brutus Booth, was actually named after the Brutus of Shakespeare's play. And his younger brother shared the same name. Uh, he was Junius Brutus Booth Jr. You can see all three brothers here, a uh, photo, I guess, taken of them while they were performing. This is John Wilkes on the end here. So obviously, the Booth family now is known in context of Abraham Lincoln's assassination. But back in the day, they were already famous for being great actors. John Wilkes's brother, Edwin, in particular, became very famous in the world of theater. And so apparently there was a bit of animosity between the two brothers, Edwin and John Wilkes, probably of a competitive nature. And when John Wilkes assassinated President Lincoln, his brother disowned him. Understandably. So we, we can see how this, uh, in this strange way, Brutus was linked to the Booth family. And we can see in John Wilkes's writings thoughts that are similar to Brutus's. Now granted, Booth's rhetoric is clogged with doctrines of white supremacy which are alien to Brutus's concerns and opinions, but we can hear a somewhat similar language in this letter that Booth wrote shortly before he assassinated Lincoln. It's here in this collection of uh, memoirs, letters, and other documents concerning Lincoln by Harold Holzer. And here's one that Booth wrote. He says, Many, I know, the vulgar herd will blame me for what I am about to do, but posterity, I am sure, will justify me. Right or wrong, God judge me, not man. This war is a war with the Constitution and the reserve rights of the state. It is a war upon Southern rights and institutions. The nomination of Abraham Lincoln four years ago bespoke war. His election forced it. I have ever held the South were right people of the North, to hate tyranny and to love liberty and justice, to strike at wrong and oppression was the teaching of our fathers. The study of our early history will not let me forget it, and may it never. I do not want to forget the heroic patriotism of our fathers who rebelled against the oppression of the mother country. This country was formed for the white, not for the black man. Now, when Booth actually killed Lincoln, and this story is pretty familiar, he snuck into a theater, came up behind him, and shot him in the back of the head. He then jumped out of the balcony that the president had been onto, had been in onto the stage. He raised a knife in the air, and this is basically copying Brutus's theatrics to a T. He shouted, Six Semper Tyrannus, which is Latin for thus always to tyrants. And although this line isn't in the play, it has been attributed for a long time to something that Brutus said right after assassinating Caesar. I think it's always helpful to examine these different eras and different places where allusions are made to the same event or work of art. When we look at the murder of Julius Caesar and see it sort of branching out into all these different topics, Roman poetry, Dante Alighieri, John Wilkes Booth, and Abraham Lincoln, uh, we see that it establishes a connection between these things and that Shakespeare's play is just one part of this web of conversation that's been had about Caesar throughout the centuries. That, for me anyway, is really cool because it's always fun to pick up allusions to other things you've read whenever they're made in a book or a movie or an everyday conversation. And so that'll just about wrap up this series on Julius Caesar. Thanks for watching, guys, and stay tuned.